Our presentation is on the radial nerve entrapment. This can occur at any point along the nerve, but it most commonly happens in the proximal forearm area around the supinator muscle where the posterior interosseous branch of the radial nerve is, but it can also occur more proximally with a humerus fracture or more distally on the radial aspect of the wrist. This can cause denervation of different wrist or digit extensors, but particularly the forearm supinator muscles are affected. There are four types of radial nerve entrapment. The first is radial nerve palsy, which is a paralysis caused by damage to the radial nerve. This most commonly happens uh, with a humeral fracture between the distal and middle thirds of the humerus. Radial nerve tunnel syndrome and posterior interosseous nerve syndrome are both compression related conditions, but they can manifest differently depending on the location of the compression of the radial nerve. And then last, we have Wartenberg syndrome, which is also compression related, but it's more of a superficial sensory nerve issue, and that manifests in mainly sensory and uh, numbness symptoms. Radial nerve entrapment is the least common of the upper extremity nerve issues compared to medial or ulnar nerve issues. Uh, radial tunnel syndrome is more of an overuse injury, but radial nerve palsy has been found to be present in about 11.8% of patients that had humeral fractures, and posterior interosseous nerve syndrome can also result from rheumatoid arthritis or other rheumatoid conditions. As far as diagnosing this condition, the gold standard is exploratory surgery. Um, radiographs can also be used to detect or rule out fractures, tumors, or healing calluses that may be causing compression of the nerve. Recent studies have found that ultrasound can also be used to find the location, type, extent of the lesion, which is a lot more cost efficient than radiographs. And most patients will also have an, uh, an adverse neural tension test positive in the radial distribution if they have radial nerve entrapment. And this is a video of what a ultrasound of the radial nerve With radial nerve palsy, some common symptoms are, of course, the paralysis, and this will be of the wrist and digit extensor muscles and forearm supinator muscles. There will also be numbness within the nerve distribution, so on the dorsoradial aspect of the hand and the radial three and a half fingers. The most common sign, however, is the wrist drop, which is pictured here, and it's commonly found with a trauma or a fracture, fracture or stroke victims. The second condition that we discussed is radial tunnel syndrome. This can prevent very similarly to lateral epicondylalgia. Uh, there's pain and tenderness in a similar area, but with radial tunnel syndrome, the pain is mainly over the anterior lateral forearm in the area of the supinator muscle and the radial neck. And the tenderness is about four finger widths before, below the lateral epicondyle, which is different from lateral epicondylalgia that has the main area of tenderness right on the epicondyle. Um, the way to differentiate between the two is to use a xylocaine injection. This is a mixture of lidocaine and cortisone, and with the injection, if the symptoms are relieved, then it's indicative of lateral epicondylalgia, but if the symptoms persist, then it's indicative of radial tunnel syndrome. Um, some aggravating factors for these patients would be wrist extension and forearm pronation, um, a good resisted test to do would be supination or extensor carbi radialis brevis extension. The third condition is posterior interosseous nerve syndrome. 
So after the radial nerve goes through the supernator muscle, it emerges as the posterior interosseous nerve, which then bifurcates into a medial and lateral branch. So compression can occur before or after this bifurcation. If it occurs after on the medial branch, certain muscles are affected, and if it occurs after the bifurcation on the lateral branch, other muscles are affected, which you can see listed here. But if the compression occurs before the nerve splits into those branches, then all of those muscles are affected. These patients may or may not complain of pain, but they will have active radial deviation weakness. This condition can also result from different rheumatological conditions such as RA. The last condition we will discuss is Wartenberg syndrome. This is a compression of the superficial sensory radial nerve. This can cause paresthesis over the dorsal radial hand. Um, it will be painful for these patients to perform a pinching of the thumb and index finger in a OK sign. Uh, a high percentage of these patients will present similar to de Quer veins, but their Finkelstein's test may or may not be positive. The To differentiate between Wartenberg and de Quer veins, you can also use the xylocaine shot method discussed earlier, but here, if the symptoms are relieved but numbness still ensues, then it's positive for Wartenberg syndrome. Uh, these patients will be aggravated by any kind of wrist movement or tight pinching, and they will have a positive Tonell's test over the radial nerve. A good intervention to start with is ultrasound. Here are the parameters for thermal ultrasound, as inducing heat to the radial tunnel and supinator will increase the extensibility of those tissues and help to release the radial nerve from its location of entrapment. The most common location of entrapment for the radial nerve is the supinator muscle. Soft tissue techniques such as ischemic compression for trigger points and myofascial release assist in mobilizing the tissue and decreasing the muscle tension around the nerve. Stretching the muscles that are involved in the entrapment of the nerve is important to again increase the extensibility of the surrounding tissue and release the radial nerve. Once you have stretched the involved muscles, it is key to strengthen them in the new range so they do not become weak and lengthened. Good directions to work in are wrist extension, radial deviation, and forearm supination, as these are some of the key muscle groups involved in grip strength, which is commonly impaired with radial nerve entrapment. A good example of eccentric and concentric wrist extension is the dowel rule, as seen here. Depending on the patient's stage of symptoms, the clinician can use neural glides to lengthen the radial nerve over time, starting with sliders when the patient is most sensitive and progressing to tensioners where the nerve is put on tension both proximally and distally at the same time. Finally, it is extremely important to evaluate the patient's work environment in order to prevent future occurrences of radial nerve entrapment and other work-related conditions. For example, an ergonomic mouse is designed to keep the wrist in a more neutral alignment, and the ergonomic keyboard was designed to reduce excessive stress on the muscles in the hand and forearm. A common outcome measure used in upper extremity conditions is the quick dash. This is a shortened version of the dash, which has 30 items instead of 11. This outcome measure is appropriate for patients with radial nerve entrapment because it looks at the patient's symptoms as well as the patient's perception of his or her ability to perform functional tasks. The quick dash is scored from 0 to 100, with 100 equating to greater disability. The minimal clinical important difference of these scores ranges from 15.91 to 20 points. With conservative treatment, the symptoms of radial nerve entrapment usually resolve and surgery is not needed. Surgery may be necessary if symptoms persist for more than 3 to 6 months or muscle wasting is present.